Jamaica. All powerful, unclaimable, all struck, we fall to our knees as you humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who's told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky, you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees and we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky, you call them by name, you are amazing God. Incomparable and unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart, you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Let's greet each other in the name of this amazing God, Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. Um, just a couple of brief announcements before, uh, before we kind of continue with worship. Um, you saw a little promo on Financial Peace University. Um, Taylor and Sarah Hughesby are going to be leading that coming up after Easter. We'll hear another announcement about that next week. We also have Carl and Julie Gady and, and some of their girls with us this morning, our missionaries to uh, Iraq and to Uganda. And they're going to be speaking between services um, just to kind of give you an update because, you know, they were, they were sent out of Iraq because of the situation in northern Iraq. And so they, they can give you an update a little bit about what's happening since they've been back in the States and how their ministry is going. And he's going to give a, just a real brief greeting at the end of the service to kind of invite you to between services, which will be in the adult forum room there. You'll see a bunch of things in the announcement bulletin, ways that you can serve. And Bible studies, again, it's about being fed, and then it's about stepping out and serving. And so there's all kinds of opportunities. And just a reminder that Holy Week is coming up. Next, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, right? And then Holy Week. And, and uh, you'll see those, those times there, uh, Easter 6.30, 8.30, and 10.30. We have three services, 6.30, 8.30, and 10.30, and we hope that you'll join us for that, that week as we walk to the cross and then to the resurrection. Well, I don't know uh, uh, what, what it's like at your house, um, but at my house uh, up at the farm, uh, we've got a muddy mess. And um, to get to my house, I've got to put her in four-wheel drive. Or else just pop the clutch and go. You know, it's one of those two. And, 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 and we get there with the help of four-wheel drive. But sometimes isn't life like that? Is your life kind of a muddy mess this morning? Do you feel a little bit like you're sloshing around? 
and you don't have four-wheel drive in your life, but you got something better. We have the promise of a God who is with us, amen, who is for us and not against us, who uh, is a God who cleanses and washes and fills and can take a muddy mess and make it a beautiful work for his kingdom. And so I'm so glad that you're here this morning because uh, I'm a little bit of a muddy mess today. I don't know about you, but I need the work of the Lord in my life. And so I'm glad you're here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks. We give thanks that you are a God who cleanses and renews, a God who brings hope and life, a God that we can trust in, for you've made promises to us, and your promises are good. And so, Father, we come this morning in need. We're in need of your presence in our life, and we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit this morning, that you'd minister to our hearts, Father, that you'd meet us where we're at, that you'd cleanse us and renew us. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, we're going we're gonna to worship again, so I invite you to stand. Lord, we're humbled in your sight, shining from above, how we need your light. Guide us in your grace, guide us home. Lord, be all that we can see. We ask for you to come, we are on our knees. Save us by your grace, lead us home. Spirit fall, hear the voices of your children call out to you. We bow down, heal the broken heart. Have mercy on us now. Love is pouring from your heart. Hope is in your hands. Life is in your arms. Here in your embrace, we are home. Spirit of God. Hear the voices of your children call out to you. We bow down, heal the broken heart, have mercy on us now. Our glory, our power is yours. Of your children call out to you. We bow down, heal the broken heart, have mercy on us now, have mercy on us now. Well, my big dog likes to roll in the mud. In fact, if he can find manure, that's where he wants to be. He loves to roll in manure. And the only way that he can ever come in is I've got to wash him up. So he doesn't come in very often because as soon as I wash him up, he's gone. I don't know about you, but um, if it weren't for, uh, for the reality of a Savior who washes, I'd be in real trouble. We all would be. 
because we get ourselves so filthy sometimes. The world is just it's a broken place, and we're a broken people. Amen? My, my default is to brokenness. Scripture says that we were born sinful. And so we need this cleansing. And we have a God who comes and gathers us up and, and, and says, I'm going to wash you because I want you in with me. I want you where I am, he says in John chapter 14. And the only way that's going to happen is by washing. So he does it. He says, come to me, bring your stuff. Bring all the muck and the mud that you got. And I've got the water of life. So let's I invite you just to take a moment of silence and just kind of bring your, your, your muck to the Lord and just lay it at his feet and then hear the words of promise. So he speaks this into your life. My child, my child, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. Rest in your faith, my peace will come to you. But when I hear the praises start, oh my child, I want to rain upon you. Blessings that will fill your heart, for I see no stain upon you. Because you are my child and you know me, to me you're only holy. Nothing that you've done will remain, only what you do for me. You have been forgiven and washed and cleansed by Jesus Christ. You are a new creation, unblemished, white as snow, forgiven. That is the truth. Believe it. Wonderful, merciful Savior, Precious Redeemer and friend Who would have thought that a lamb Would rescue the souls of men Oh, you rescue the souls of men Counselor, comforter, keeper Spirit we long to embrace You offer hope when our hearts Have hopelessly lost the way Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way You are the one that we praise You are the one we adore always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for almighty infinite father faithfully loving your own here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Good acapella. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. 
Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Have a seat. your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 18. If you'd like a Bible to follow along, you can just raise your hand and an usher will see you from the back and bring you one to follow along if you'd like. First Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. <clears throat> For the message of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligence I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, we are such um, needy folks. We need your strength, your peace. We need your spirit to be poured out. Father, Scripture says that's by your Spirit that we have understanding of the words in Scripture. And so we pray that you'd pour out your Spirit to open up understanding to us. It's by your Spirit that you knit us together in community and make the body of Christ that is the church. And so we pray that you'd do that and that you'd encourage us this morning in faith. Pray that you'd empty me of myself, Father. Fill me with your Spirit that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, Lord, could be acceptable in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, well, it's the last time here that I'm going to have to kind of give you a little bit of a recap because we're moving into Holy Week, and we've been talking about the beginning of this year. So this is kind of my last little recap of this. For those of you who haven't been around to what we've been at and what we've been doing, the beginning of this year we've been talking about New Year's resolutions, but not our resolutions, God's resolutions towards us, that he makes to us, the promises that God makes to us. So we have been doing this as a way to kind of ground ourselves once again, our lives on the promises of God, because it's by those promises that we move from a life where we strive to make our mark in the world to a life that is marked in order to make a difference in the world for Jesus' sake. You see, God's promises define us, they fill us, and they send us. So the first six weeks... We heard the promises that are for each of us personally. A new you, a living hope, rest for the soul, forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, abundant life. And from those personal promises from God to you, they weren't meant to be kept, were they? They weren't meant to be hoarded for ourselves. Instead, by those promises, God turns us to the world, empowered by those personal promises. And as he turns us, he gives us promises that guide our work out there in the world. So for the last couple of weeks, we've heard about these promises. The promise, first of all, of purpose, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, from Ephesians chapter 2, right? We were created for good works, and so in the promise of persons, in the promise of, of purpose, we are grounded and we are gifted and we are going. And then last week we discovered that as we turn to the world and our neighbors, not only do we have the promise of purpose, but we have the promise of power, power, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of God at work in you and me, and it's by that Holy Spirit that we have the power to comprehend what I just talked about in in the prayer, power that makes us confident, and by the promised power we are capable, we can accomplish whatever God asks of us. Remember last week we ended with, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, Romans chapter 8. 
So now today, the promise of purpose and power all lead us into this promise of proclamation, the promise of our proclamation. We have something to say to the world. Did you know that? Three words are going to guide us today. They're on your sheet there. They are madness, the message, and the mandate. The madness, the message, and the mandate. The madness of what we proclaim, the message of our proclamation, and the mandate that God gives us to tell the world about Jesus. So first of all, let's just briefly define the word proclamation. The definition of proclamation is this. It's a public announcement, especially one dealing with a matter of great importance. Well, when we tell others about Jesus, we are sharing a message of immense importance, right? In Jesus, we are saved. We have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. We have victory because of his victory on the cross, a victory over sin, over death, and over the devil. Is there a matter of more greater importance than what we proclaim in God through Jesus Christ? Is there anything more important than that? No, there's nothing greater. So what we proclaim, what we say, has huge implications for everyone who hears it. That's why we are public with it. It's why we speak, why it's not something that that we keep to ourselves. Remember, faith in Jesus Christ is not private. I think the devil loves that one. Faith should be private. Because what, what happens to the effectiveness of God's people when they believe that lie that faith is private? Nothing happens in the church, does it? People don't talk to each other. People don't step out in faith and share the message. Here's the thing. Faith is not private. It is personal. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But we are called to be public with our personal relationships with Jesus. This means that none of us are exempt from proclaiming Jesus to our neighbor. Amen? That was a really weak amen. Here's where we find our first word for today, that the promise that God gives us for our proclamation, about our proclamation, is madness. This is madness. It's sheer insanity. Look at verse 18 from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness. Is foolishness. In verse 25, for the foolishness of God. The message of the cross is foolishness. It's sheer insanity. The root word here where it says foolishness, if you underline that word, the root word in Greek is moria. It's it's the root word where we get the word moron from. Stupidity. Folly is a really kind way of saying this. The word of the cross is moronic. It is stupidity. That's a bit more of what's being said here. Now, it isn't folly to us, it isn't moronic to us, but the word, the message of the cross is stupid to those who are perishing. Our proclamation is madness for two reasons. One, because God uses us. That's the first thing we're going to talk about in terms of madness. God uses us. And the second, because of what we are saying, what the message actually is, and that's the second point that we're going to get to. We'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, us. Let's look at verse 21 21 there. 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. The foolishness of what we proclaim. God uses our words to save others. Shouldn't God use some more capable people? Shouldn't God use people without pasts, without issues? Anybody here without any issues this morning? That's good. We wouldn't have to, we didn't want to have to beat somebody up between services. I'm just totally kidding. We would never do that. We all have issues, don't we? We all have pasts. So look at the method that God uses. He calls these people with, with pasts and with issues, and he uses them to save others. And you go, well, really? Is that When we look at Scripture, when we look at the witness throughout Scripture, we find this happening in the Old Testament, how God uses people, broken people, calls them as his people. We get, we get Jacob, who's a con man. We get Moses, who's a murderer. We get Jeremiah, who's just a boy. 
And then we get into the New Testament, and, and, and Jesus chooses 12 disciples. And, and come on, these guys are bumbling at best most of the time, aren't they? And they got issues. And that's just a few. I mean, we could go through this long list of men and women that don't seem overly qualified or overly capable. And some of them are even hostile to God. But that's who God has chosen to use to be proclaimers of the good news that is Jesus Christ. God even used Saul for crying out loud, a persecutor, a killer of Christians. Turn to Acts chapter 9, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 9. And what you see is, is, is there's a progression in the book of Acts. At the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. And when you see Stephen being stoned at the end of chapter 7, Saul is standing holding the coats of everybody who stones Stephen. When you get to chapter 8 at the beginning, it talks about the fact that Saul was given the ability to persecute the church. So the first three verses of chapter 8 are about how Saul is breathing threats and murder. Chapter 9, again, Saul is breathing threats and murder. Chapter 9, verse 1. And something happens to him, though. You remember Saul is knocked off, knocked down on the road, and he's got scales on his eyes. And, and the Lord speaks to him in Acts chapter 9. Saul's conversion. And he becomes Paul. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, many letters, but he was a Christian persecutor and killer. Look at verse 13. Ananias is a very, is a very faithful guy, and, and, uh, and, and Saul has been blinded, and, and Jesus has spoken to him. He says, now, you know, why are you persecuting me? And get up, and in verse uh, 6 there, you get up and go to a city, and, and uh, you will be told what you must do. And then, and then, then the Lord appears to Ananias in a dream. And then Ananias and says to go to Saul. And in verse 13 he says, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy church people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority for the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. And then jump to verse 20. 20 uh, 19, 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, verse 20. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among whose, um, those who call on Jesus' name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to, to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah by proving that Jesus, Paul, becomes this incredible man of faith. Look at his past. So what does that mean for us? When we, somebody, somebody like Saul, God takes and uses to proclaim Jesus. What does that mean for us? Well, in this time and place, right now in history, do you know who God has chosen to be proclaimers of his love, of his grace, of his forgiveness, and of his promises? Should we all go? Like, let's go back to our cars. Tip, tiptoe very carefully out of the church, right? God is choosing you and me. Anyone who hear, has ears to hear today, let them hear. God has chosen you as one of his proclaimers. It's why he brought you here today. I saw somebody recently, I hadn't seen in 25 years, I had done this little recording project recently, and I was down in Northfield, back to where I went to college, and I was down there, and I ran into somebody that I hadn't seen in 25 years. Uh, Maybe better than that. Uh, and we were talking, and, and, he, and he looked at me uh, a little bit, uh, you know, out of the corner of his eye. Had my, I, was, I had my hair down, which I normally don't do around here, you know. I was on Northfield incognito, and I ran into this friend. And, and, uh, and he said to me, he said, uh, he, he looked at me, he goes, now, um, you're pastor, right? There was a little bit of, like, question marks at the end of everything he said, you know, right? And I go, yeah, this really cool church in, in Marshall down in southwest Minnesota, yep, my pastor. And then he goes, kind of looks at me kind of sideways, and he goes, um, what kind of pastor are you? <laughs> you see, if God can use me, and if God can use Paul, then God can use you. God can use you. I like the Amen. The first part of the madness of how God chooses to proclaim this good news that is in Jesus Christ for the world is that he chooses to do it through you and me. It's, it's madness. 
The second part of the madness is the message itself. (laughs) The message itself. That's the second word today, the message of our proclamation. Look at verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. And what is that crazy message that we are given? Let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Acts, Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 6. And you're going to put, your, put a marker in Romans. We'll be back to there. But Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Paul, the Apostle Paul that we just talked about, wrote Romans, and he said this. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Verse 8, underline this, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Son of God lays down his life for you and me. God, perfect totally sovereign, needing nothing, eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, lays down his life for us. The death of Jesus brings about life. Eternal and abundant. Death brings life. Weakness brings strength. (laughs) This This is nonsensical to the world. To those who are perishing. But God chose to make foolish the wisdom of the world. The world doesn't know God through wisdom. Remember last week we talked about this? We talked about this last week? We talked about how the promise of the Holy Spirit and how through that Holy Spirit we are given the power to comprehend Scripture, the power to comprehend who God is and how God is at work and where God is at in our life and in our world. Trusting Jesus is a movement of the Holy Spirit through faith. It happens by the heart in faith, not by the head in smarts. So not only is this message crazy, God dying for me so that I might live, God also makes it ridiculously simple for us to be saved and to save others. Anybody with me? Are we awake? This is ridiculously simple. Look to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 few chapters back from chapter 5 there, go to 10, verse 8. Romans 10, 8. Chapter 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The Lord is near you. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. So God places the, a word in you. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. This is what we say. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, underline it, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's it. Are you kidding me? Don't we try to make that so much more complicated than it is? Don't we make following, trusting in the Lord, being a Christian, you know, loving God? We, we, don't we just, uh, come on, uh, anybody else overcomplicate this thing? And so sometimes we need to just get down to brass tacks. What is it that makes you a Christian? Believing and confessing. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. It's John 3, 16. Confess that it's true with your lips. I believe that you died for me and that my sins have been forgiven because of Jesus' blood. And believe it, not because you can prove it or because you can know it with your head, but because it is said, it is promised, and we can believe it with our heart. Because it's promised. You see, we don't believe in a feeling. We don't believe in an intellectual kind of layout, rational argument. We believe in a promise, amen? That's a much different affair And we're bad at believing in promises because we break promises and promises get broken to us. But this is a God who doesn't break promises. Amen? This is not not a promise, promise breaker, but a promise maker. And one who fulfills all promises. 
If you don't know if you're saved, I invite you to talk to me after the service or call me this week. We'll pray together and we'll talk about what this new life in Christ looks like. But it is madness, this message. Through it, the wisdom of the world is brought down and made nothing. <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 20. The end of chapter 1, at, at, at chapter 1, verse 20, the end of verse 20, kind of the second half of verse 20. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21. For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the foolishness, the moronic, the stupidity of what was preached, of what we preached, to save those who believe. Jesus died for you. He loves you. Now here's the mandate. Here comes the mandate. See, we believe in the madness of the message. Now we're called to step out and speak. This is the mandate. God says, speak up. Look at Romans chapter 10 again. Romans 10, verse 13. Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one that they have not believed in? This is verse 14, 10, 14. How can they believe in the one in whom they have not yet heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching it to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent, as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? We have a mandate from God to proclaim. How are they going to know unless we go, unless we speak, unless we tell them? God says, bring the good news to the world. We can find it throughout Scripture. You can go to Matthew chapter 28 and read this when you get home. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. It's called the Great Commission. Jesus says, basically, go and tell others. It never says in Scriptures that you need to understand every theological issue before you open up your mouth. Or explain theologically how God accomplishes salvation. That is not what we're, God is asking you to do. It just says go. Go. And tell them what God has done for you. And let them know that God can, what God can do for them. Share with others the good news. The good news is Jesus. Pastor Dave, <clears throat> that's not my gift. That's not my gift. I, I'm just going to serve. Yep, I, I get that. I understand that. Some of us have spiritual gifts of service. That's kind of our primary way. And we can, we can share God's love through deeds as well, for sure. We can, we can serve others in love and reflect God's love to others. That's one way that God works and speaks through us. But here's the thing. I know we get intimidated, right, by praying or inviting or telling or speaking in the name of Jesus. I get that. But I also think that sometimes we use that as an excuse not to talk. Or tell others and we have to be real honest sometimes we just got to get clean with ourselves where um where we go uh, i use that in a way that's not helpful lord and i know that you're calling me to speak as well you're calling me to step out we all every one of us must understand that our message is urgent and that others need to hear what god has given us to say Remember what I said earlier? God's chosen you and I to save others through this foolish message, but we have to say it. We have to speak the name of Jesus. We have a name above every name, the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. I mean, we have a name of power. We have a message of salvation, and we got people who are lost, and we have good news. Have you ever been talking with somebody who's really going through it or worried or lost and in your heart you just keep feeling a nudge, you keep feeling a little bit of a poke and you have this sense that you should say something, that you should tell them about your hope or that you should maybe pray for them or tell them you'll pray for them or that you should remind them of God's love for them or that maybe you should invite them into a fellowship or a Bible study or to church? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, tell them, tell us that it's, that it's going to save them. That proclaiming Jesus does something in their hearts and in their minds. I want to give you a verse from Isaiah. It's in the Old Testament, about the middle of the book. 
If you get past Psalms and Proverbs, you'll get to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. It's a big book in the Old Testament. About the middle, at, verse, at, at Isaiah 55, verse 10, it says this. Isaiah 55, 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return to it, bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater. Farmers, come on, we can get this, right? So it is, underline it, so is my word that goes out of, from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word's in you. He's placed it in you. It's not your word. What we proclaim is God's word. And he, is, he carried all the sins of the world to the cross so that we could have life and proclaim life to others and feel a little awkward. We get the good stuff. We are promised that our proclamation will do amazing things in the life of the people that we share Jesus with. You see... This isn't a sermon that, I, that was written um, for you to go home and ponder. I believe God gave it to me because there are people He is trying to reach in your life. People you know that He wants to speak to through you. I also know that God wrote this sermon for me. That there are people in my life that I believe God wants me to talk with that God's put on my heart. And I'm going to pray that God will use me in their life. I'm going to pray that God will open up doors for me to have conversations with them. I'm not going to force it. I'm going to pray that God opens doors. And when I feel the nudge, I'm going to pray that God will fill me with boldness and give me the word so that when the door opens, that I'll walk through and I'll proclaim to them the good news of Jesus in the right way, with the right words, with the right love and compassion. How about you? Could it be that this sermon was written by God for you because there is someone that God is trying to reach and he needs your voice, your story, to reach them with his message of love and salvation? Wouldn't that be insane? <laughs> Almost moronic? If God used you and me to save people with such a simple message? It's madness. But we have a message and we have a mandate. So will you join me? Will you join me in telling the lost and the broken and the defeated and the doubted and the dying about Jesus? Because I believe in God's promises. Every one of them. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 20. I believe all the promises that we've been going through this past month and a half are true. I believe them all, totally and completely, every single one that God promises. Even this, to use our proclamation to save others. And it's urgent. So let's go. Heavenly Father, we give thanks. We give thanks that this isn't our work, it's your work. We give thanks that it isn't our word, it's your word that you've given to us, Jesus Christ, and words that you place on our hearts and compassion that you give us for others. These are the things that you do in our life. You simply say, when you feel it, when I'm giving it to you, step out and speak. And so, Father, give us opportunities this week. Open up possibilities for us to to reflect your love and grace and to say the name of Jesus into somebody else's life. I pray, Father, for um, the promises that we've gone through these past weeks, Father, and that we would take hold of them in faith, that we would believe them, not because we feel it or we can rationalize them and understand them fully, but because you've said it. You've promised it, and all your promises are yes. And so in faith, Lord, give us faith to believe and receive all your promises, Father. And send us into the world, Lord. Help us to go. Give us a boldness. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen.
We continue to worship God using our tithes and our offerings. Um, if you're a visitor or a guest here, I just want to speak to you briefly. I want to thank you for coming. If you're a guest or visitor, checking out the church, maybe here with family or, or maybe here to driving by or maybe here because you're looking for a church home. If, if you are looking for a church home in, uh, in the area here, we'd invite you to consider um, joining us um, to proclaim the salvation through Jesus Christ to the world. If you want to know more about the church, there's a welcome center. Right when you go out the doors on a hard left, there's a welcome and a kind of a countertop there with somebody standing there to talk to you a little bit about who we are. There's a lot of good churches in this area. We're not the only gig in town. But if God is calling you, we'd invite you to come join us. Here's the thing. If you're a guest or a visitor this morning, I want you to know as we receive this morning's offering, your presence here is offering enough. Thank you so much for coming. We pray that you're blessed. For those of us where this is our worshiping community, this is a time when we worship God with our tithes and our offerings. And we're going to sing an old hymn, Precious Lord. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the way grows clear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears, precious Lord, night draws near, and the day is past and gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Verse first. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I'm weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find that on the screen above. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, baptism uh, is a gift um, that God gives to us. It is a gift from God for us. Uh, in this sacrament, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That comes actually from Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, where it says, All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so it's through this gift of baptism that our Heavenly Father gives us that we are born children of, of God. The, the sin, the removal of sin, the, the possibility for relationship occurs. 
And it's by water, which happens throughout Scripture, really. We see uh, all over Scripture. I like to kind of be messy with this, so it's going to go all over probably. Because God is abundant, and he pours out his love and his grace uh, on us and on the church. And out, throughout Scripture, water is a sign of, of cleansing and rebirth. You know, around here, we're a little bit odd. We, we baptize infants. We don't make people baptize infants. We baptize adults if they want to be baptized. We just know that it's a promise from God for us that connects us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and by that resurrection, connects us to life. And so um, it's important that we, that we do this. It's commanded by God. So we baptize infants, adults, doesn't matter. But what's very important is that not only in baptism, this isn't a silver bullet, we've got to teach faith because it's faith that receives the promises of what happens in baptism. And so with that in mind, I'm going to talk to the sponsors first, Taylor and Sarah and uh, Chelsea and Eric. Do you intend to sponsor Riker in his baptism and as he grows into his adult life in his faith? If so, respond, we do. And I'm going to charge you then, I, I mentioned it earlier, I said um, the way I kind of, uh, kind of sum up um, sponsoring or being a godparent is just to say, if you're not praying, I don't know who is, right? So to really hold Riker in prayers, but also to, to give Riker an example of a life that lives for Christ, that knows Christ, that loves Christ, that worships Jesus. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a way of, of helping these two, Ryan, Ryan and Sally, to, to bring up Riker in faith. And so that's part of your role. It's, it's no small responsibility. And so thank you for agreeing to do it. And Ryan and Sally, do you desire for Riker to be baptized into the Christian faith today? If so, respond, we do. I'm going to charge you then as parents, right, to, uh, to faithfully teach Riker the Ten Commandments, the Creed, um, the Lord's Prayer, bring to church, put scripture in his hand. These are just ways of kind of surrounding him in faith because like I said, baptism is a gift from God. It's something God does in our life, but it's our faith, trusting that, that receives what God is up to here, that claims the work that God is doing today. And so it's so important as, as parents and as sponsors that we, that we do that work to, to bring him around faithful people that he can lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. Riker, <clears throat> receive the cross on your head, on your heart the sign of the Lord, be strengthened in faith, be patient in suffering, and that through faith you might live in Jesus and with Jesus all the days of your life. Amen. Come and be baptized. Riker, Ryan, Ganifki, I baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You've been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. Let's pray. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks that through the death and resurrection of Jesus and by faith, you free us from the power of sin and raise us up to new life. By the Holy Spirit, which you've poured out on Riker, daily increase in him your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. And look with kindness upon Sally and Ryan as they now have two. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness and strengthen them in their own faith so they can share eternally with Riker the salvation that you have given us through Jesus Christ. And all God's people say together, Amen. Well, we uh, light a candle. This can be used as a, as, uh, on the anniversary of Riker's baptism. I'm going to give you that, Justin. You can hand that. Um, and as part of even as part of sponsors and as parents, one of the one of the things that 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 our role is, and as the church, is to is to remind Riker and to speak into Riker's life over and over to let Riker let your light so shine before others that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so that candle is a kind of a, a way to think about that and remember that it's also something you can use to kind of celebrate this day of baptism throughout his life and to encourage him in faith, uh, the day of confirmation, just any kind of special occasion in his life to to light that candle and to remember it. Hey, do you want to hold, can you hold this for me? Can, can you hold that for me? That's, that's the, thank you, that's awesome. No, I'm not going to do that? It's all right, I'm going to take Riker. And Sally said that he's, he's, he can get real upset. And we weren't sure this was going to work. But he is... totally content. And we walk him into the congregation as a way of saying, like I said, baptism is a wonderful gift from God, but if we don't receive it in faith, 
And so we have a responsibility. So we bring Riker into the midst of the congregation as a way of saying, we have a responsibility in Riker's life to, to teach him, to bring faith, and to, and to walk with his parents. I'm going to lay, Sarah, I'm going to lay Riker in your arms here. And so we lay him in the arms of the congregation as a way to kind of highlight that fact. We have a big responsibility now, church. We've got a big responsibility. And so let's stand, and we're going to welcome Riker. Is that up there? Do we have the welcome Riker? into the Lord's family. Let's, let's read these words together. We welcome you into the Lord's family and into this church. We receive you as a member of the body of Christ, child of the same Heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. Let's give thanks for Riker. <laughs> thanks, you guys. Thanks, you, can get you can get them. You can blow that out. We enter into a, uh, a time of prayer. A um, um, couple of just things to lift up in prayer. Um, um, Julie Copperud's father, uh, Raleigh Rue, passed away. I think it was yesterday. So I'm going to keep Julie uh, and Duane in prayers, Julie and their family. i got a note here. Um, uh, Josh O'Donnell, a young father needing a lung transplant from Milroy. So um, Brenda Holmberg does some daycare for the family. So we're going to lift up Josh um, O'Donnell. Um, and we're going to pray for Denny and Anita Van Veldhuysen. They're leaving. They are, they're moving down closer to your family, right, Anita? And um, what, what we like to do when people leave is to lay hands on them and pray for them. But they got a lot of kids, and coming up they were feeling a little bit uncertain about that. So I'm going to have people gather around them and put hands on them to kind of pray for them and bless them as they leave. We'll do that in just a minute. But are there other prayers? Yeah. Awesome, 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 awesome. Name? Do you want me to lift up? Do you want me to lift up his name in prayer? Carrie? Terry, we'll give, yep, we'll give thanks for his healing and continued healing. Other? Yeah. What's that, Julissa? Say it again. Awesome. So you've got a new, new pet at home. We're going to give thanks for uh, dogs are an awesome gift from God, aren't they, Julissa? So well, that's great. Yep. Levon, um, um, Lou's sister, also Jerry Matzner's um, mother, so I don't know if you knew that connection, but uh, they uh, is having surgery tomorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we give thanks and praise for the ways that you um, bless us. And one of the ways that you have given us, uh, that's just an incredible gift, is the gift of prayer that we can come before the throne of grace with our friends and neighbors, our concerns, our joys in our life, and we can just lay them directly in your arms. And so we claim that this morning. We, we lift up to you, Father, um, Julie Copperwood's family, and we just ask for a covering over them the death of Julie's father, Raleigh. It's been a, a number of years of kind of struggle, and so we're thankful that his struggle is over, but now grief is there as well. And so, Father, come with the promise of the resurrection, and wrap your arms around Julie and her family. We give thanks for Raleigh's life. Lord, we are thankful for Terry and for healing and for a restoration being back at home, but he's got a little bit of a long haul here, and so we pray for your continued hand of healing to be on him. We ask for a covering over him. We pray for Levon as, uh, as she enters some surgery tomorrow as well and, and pray for a good outcome for her, freedom from infection, and just for a restoration of life. We're thankful, Father, for Julissa's dog that, uh, that she has um, rescued and now adopted. And we, we give thanks, Father, for the encouragement that pets and dogs bring into our life in the ways, Lord, that you teach us through them. And we lift up Josh, Lord, a young man needing, young father needing lung transplant. Father, we pray that you would go before him each step of the way, Lord, that you'd lead each step, that you would surround him, Father, and his family, give them hope and strength and peace in Jesus Christ. We know that you're the great physician and the healer, and so we lay him in your arms. We ask all this in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, 
Can I get a couple of people back there around Anita and Denny and their family right back there? And they're right in front of, yep, there you go. A couple of leaders to lay hands on them. And then can we just turn and what we like to do as a congregation is just kind of lift up our hands towards them so we can bless them as they, as they move. They just adopted three kids and they've got three kids and they're moving closer to home. And Anita's going to be doing some youth directing and down there. And so Denny, we're just going to pray over them. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for the, the Van Veldhuizens, Lord, for Denny and Anita, for their family, for their children, for their heart for the Lord, Lord, and their heart for kids. And Father, we just ask a blessing on them as they move, Lord, that you would go before them, be present with them, Father, that you would pave the way in schools for the, for the kids uh, that, uh, that they enter in, Father, and that there's a good transition there, and for friends, and for the joy of family, for the home that they're coming, we pray a blessing over their home. We pray for Anita and Danny's hearts, Lord, as they leave and as they begin something new, Father. We just ask that you would, that you would encourage them in faith, Lord, strengthen them, give them the uh, ability abilities that they need as parents and for one another and to serve you, Lord. We ask for a covering over this family in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, all right. Um. Here I am before you, falling in love and seeking you true, knowing that your perfect grace has brought me to this place. Because of you I freely live My life to you, oh God, I give So I stand before you, God And I lift my voice Cause you set me free So I shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim That I am yours I am yours good you've done for me I lift up my hands for all to see you're the only one who brings me to my knees share this love across the earth the beauty of your holy word so I kneel before you God but I lift my hands cause you set me free your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours I am yours and all that I am I place into your loving hands I am yours I am yours Son, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. Here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. So I shout out your name. From the rooftops I proclaim, I am yours, I am yours. And all that I am, I place into your loving hands, I am yours, I am yours. Favor, granting his peace. Have an awesome day. Come here, Carl, with me today.